In December 1992, pig farmer Ralph Vollmer was starting to worry. His wife Joan was behaving incredibly strangely. She'd taken to lurching and dancing around outside, arms flailing about her head, swearing loudly at nobody in particular. He heard her making noises like a pig or a dog. Sometimes she acted like, in his words, a prostitute, bounding through the fields naked, spouting foul language and generally behaving quite unladylike. To her devout, God-fearing husband, Ralph, it wasn't schizophrenia or a psychotic break. No, not at all. Perish the thought. It was all very clear. Joan's body had been possessed by demons. At first, he tried to rid her of these demons himself by locking her in the basement, and then when that was unsuccessful, by tying her to the bed. Joan screamed throughout the night, however, and the demons remained. It was time to call in the professionals. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates, and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something, and every week I bring you a case from Australia's true crime history. If this sounds interesting to you, please help us out by shooting the like button with your trusty boomstick, and hitting the subscribe button, or stabby stabby, and then punching the notification bell in the face to be notified every time we release a new video. All of our episodes are released at the same time in podcast format on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your true crime podcast fix. Also, we now have something about murder merchandise. Designed by myself, as well as Australian artist Redneck Kung Fu, it's just a few things here and there, a couple of t-shirts, but I'll put the link in the description. If you'd like to support our channel by buying me a beer or a coffee, please do so at buymeacoffee.com forward slash jsomething. It takes a lot of time to put together these episodes, and it's much better to have a beer to look forward to after filming. Link is in the description. On a lonely road in the tiny Victorian outback town of Antwerp sits a lonely house. It's been sold at least two times since it was encased in cling wrap and a woman was tied to a chair in the living room for a terrifying and violent exorcism. Boarded up and unoccupied for two decades, it's become the place for terrified teenagers to visit as a dare and to hold seances. So far, none of them have been able to reach into the afterlife for Joan Volmer the woman subjected to deprivation, pain, bizarre rituals, and eventual death at the hands of an extreme religious group over 30 years ago. A caution, there may be language in this episode that suggests I am critical of Christianity. I'm not, and I am, however, critical of any reasoning that may lead people to inflict the torturous pain like in the following episode. This is the exorcism of Joan Volmer. Antwerp is a small town in Victoria in the Shire of Hindmarsh, 350 kilometres northwest of Melbourne. It was originally settled by Europeans in 1846 for sheep grazing. By 1858, two Protestant missionaries had arrived in the area and they built a church and a mission for the local First Nations community. The local community were converted and in 1860, First Nations people from the area began being baptised by the two missionaries. The local school and post office opened in 1891. During the 1880s, the town became known for its distillation of eucalyptus oil under the brand name Emu. Large grain silos were built there in the 1950s and larger social infrastructure like sports facilities, a Methodist church and a large store reflected the growing community as the town began to expand. However, in the 70s, the township's population was no longer increasing. The school shut in the early 80s, the grain silos remain unused to this day, and the post office closed in 1990. At the last census, the township had a population of only 63 people. On a lonely road in the town of Antwerp sits a secluded house. This was the home of Ralph and Joan Vollmer. They were pig farmers, without any children. Ralph, a German migrant, was 53 years old and a fervent Christian in the local church. 49-year-old Joan wasn't that spiritual, but Ralph forced her to attend religiously every week. 
Both on their second marriage, they'd moved to the Antwerp area in 1987, finding comfort in the local Salvation Army group. But soon Ralph moved on to the proper happy clappy charismatic Christian sect. Charismatic Christianity is a form of Christianity that emphasizes the work of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts um, are an everyday part of a believer's life. It usually involves situations of people in the congregation being taken by the spirits and speaking in tongues or writhing on the floor. You've seen it before. It was in the warm summer months at the start of 1993 that Ralph decided his wife needed to be saved. Joan had been showing signs of mental breakdown since 1990. She was said to be in an unstable condition for many years leading into her death, stemming from the suicide of her first husband and the sexual abuse that she allegedly endured as a child. By September of that year, uh, 1990, Ralph had Joan admitted as an involuntary inpatient to a psychiatric hospital where she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and depression. She was at the psychiatric hospital for around three weeks and was given medication to help alleviate her symptoms. Upon release, Joan immediately stopped taking this medication. Her problems continued. In fact, they became worse. Joan was known to run through the nearby fields naked as the day God made her, and not really behaving like her normal self. She'd taken to lurching and dancing around outside, arms flailing about her head, uh, swearing loudly at nobody in particular. Ralph heard her making noises like a pig or a dog. Friends urged further psychiatric treatment. The schizophrenia was getting worse. But our mate Ralph, well, he didn't see it that way. No, nah, this was not the work of schizophrenia or a psychotic break. This was the devil. Yep, Ralph decided his wife was possessed by evil spirits. Totally normal response. He first tried uh, tying Joan to the bed to rid her of the demons himself, but she wriggled free and escaped. He then locked her in the basement of the farmhouse, but she made such a racket that Ralph couldn't sleep. She became hysterical. He decided he was left with no alternative but to call in the professionals. So he sent for his neighbour and his close friend, John Reichenbach, who, when not tending the hogs and the ducks in his own barnyard, was also part of the charismatic Christian congregation. Ralph and John writhed and shook together whenever the Holy Spirit visited upon them in church. Surely John would know what to do. John and his wife Leanne, well, they ran to Ralph's farm to deliver their own diagnosis, and they agreed with Ralph. Joan was possessed. But by how many demons? Well, they could not say. John did a quick head count anyway, like maybe 10 different spirits. He saw an abusive one who appeared to dislike listening to the Bible. A theatrical type who played games and, and deals in an attempt to escape punishment. And a few others who were harder to identify as they were hidden. The three people prayed loudly around Joan's flailing body and refused to let her leave. Home was the safest place for these demons. Joan rang uh, Leah Clugston, who was the leader of the congregation to which they all belonged. Leah began her ministry after being expelled from Reverend Roger Atzi's Lutheran Church for diagnosing uh, possession in cases ranging from grief to uh, the common cold. And after hearing the details um, that Joan's behaviour, uh, Leah concluded that if the woman was undoubtedly possessed, and the devil would have to be dealt with, as he was not welcome in Antwerp, where good Christians live. So armed with uh, Clugston's diagnosis, John Reichenbach read a few more Bible passages to Joan and firmly warned the demons they were in big trouble if they stayed inside her. He then left for a more pressing commitment, leaving his wife to keep a watch on Ralph. With Leanne's assistant, Ralph got straight to work on his wife, tying her down and denying her food or water. Uh, this might nourish the beasts inside of her. They prayed aloud to the heavens. God's word filling the air as the demons on Joan moaned and complained of hunger and thirst. For days this continued, the fiends becoming louder as their host became malnourished, dehydrated. Joan was yelling at them to let her go, let her live. This was clearly the work of evil spirits. She was becoming aggressive. Leanne and Ralph were convinced the devils inside her were making brave efforts to break her bonds. Ralph rang for the help of David Klingner another member of the church, who lived nearby. Ralph needed more hands as he sensed the devils were about to go on the offensive, and there was no telling just how strong they would be. David was happy to come and help in whatever way he could. 
The trio redoubled their efforts, ignoring Joan's desperate pleas uh, as they strapped her down harder, prayed incessantly by her bedside, deprived her of all nourishment and sleep, and slapping her face whenever it looked like she might fall asleep. Strangely, nothing seemed to be working. The crafty demons were now causing Joan to sob and beg and abuse her attackers in turn. That this was his poor suffering wife affected by a problem that might deserve tenderness and care didn't appear to mean anything to our mate Ralph. As a Christian, it was his duty to rid his wife of evil. This wasn't Joan. No, no, no. This wasn't his wife anymore. It was the vessel of the spirits. They weren't hurting Joan. She was a host to demonic forces that must be overpowered and destroyed. Her body the barrier to the very devil himself. It was time to call in Matthew Nusky, the assistant greenkeeper at Ringwood Municipal Golf Course. I mean, he was 23 years old and a golf maintenance guy. He was, wasn't even the head golf maintenance guy. But hey, surely he was a veteran of exorcisms. His mother Kathy had recommended him to the group. Nah, it was to be his first exorcism. Nusky took one look at the situation and instantly knew what needed to be done. He sent the others into town to fetch as much cling wrap and olive oil as they could get. When they returned, he blessed the oil and ordered them to douse themselves in it while he ran around the house seven times with the cling wrap, making sure all windows and doors were sealed to prevent any passing demons from coming inside to join the party. He then ordered that everything belonging to Joan, every piece of crockery, every ornament and porcelain statuette, every framed picture and item of jewellery, be smashed to pieces with a sledgehammer for fear that demons were hiding inside them too and that all of uh, Joan's flower beds and her greenhouse vegetables, he ordered that they be obliterated too so that no spirits use them as camouflage while sneaking up on the house. Cling film, olive oil and destruction. The signs of a real professional exorcist. Anyway, for one moment, what the fuck is going on? In the early morning hours of the 30th of January, Matthew decided it was time to get real with the demons. He harassed them, screaming at them mere inches from Joan's face, slapping the woman's head with the full force of his hand, demanding the demonic spirits inside of her come out and identify themselves. There was a big one named Legion. He was the master. There were several others, including a mother and daughter duo named Princess Joan and Princess Baby Joan who were likely, claimed Nusk, to uh, stick together and make life difficult for anyone trying to purge them from their host. Their eradication would best be achieved, he claimed, by beating the spirits out of their hostage. Joan Volmer was now lashed to a chair against the fireplace. Her body turned from the north, the direction from which Matthew ascertained that the spirits were approaching. Her feet were tied to wooden stocks, and then she was thrashed and beaten as the devils begged for mercy. Joan fought back as hard as she could, but our so-called heroes fought harder, responding to every violent outburst and kick of defence with assaults of their own from every point of Joan's compass. Her legs were kicked, her face was pummeled, Matthew Nusky slammed her head into cupboards and walls. The poor woman's body was becoming a blue bag of bruises that would surely show the devils inside her who was the boss. They then decided to strap her to the chair because she had been throwing herself on the floor and lying in a sexual position. The demon was gaining strength from this legs apart position. And while Joan was tied to the chair, Matthew forcibly held her eyelids back by pulling the skin up to the bone so she could see the presence of the Lord. This is some clockwork orange bullshit. The demons were clever. They tried everything from fighting aggressively to sobbing and pleading and pathetic attempts to appeal to the sympathies of those gathered. Sometimes, Princess Baby Joan begged Joan's attackers to stop in a childlike voice that might have melted their hearts had they not been so wary of the devil's cunning. Matthew spat in the child's face and sent his fist crashing into her ear. The devil was told he was no match for the crusaders of God. As Joan fought harder, literally in a fight for her life, the abuse became so violent that, at one moment, Ralph was forced to leave the room to avert his eyes from what he was seeing. And while his wife wailed and howled in the room next door, Ralph consulted the good old Lord for strength. And God assured him 
through Leanne, David and Matthew, whose voices the Almighty evidently found to carry more authority than his own, that what they were doing was right. They were not harming Joan. What they were doing was an expression of the greatest Christian love for her. Any ordinary person may have withered and died under the cruel punishment they were administering, but Joan was still alive, fighting with them, struggling like an ox. Her survival through the violence was proof alone that she was clearly being driven by demons of terrifying strength and resilience. His moment of weakness subsided, Ralph returned to the room to continue with the others. When Joan looked up at him, her sad eyes begging through tears for deliverance, Ralph refused to be moved by the forces of Satan, and so he smashed her in the face with the Holy Bible. At last, the spirits appeared to be departing in the blood, piss and shit that spilled from their host. By late afternoon, Nusky had ascertained that only Princess Joan and Princess Baby Joan had been bold enough to withstand the punishment, clutching to each other in Joan Volmer's stomach, refusing to come out. Maybe they were in the womb. The mother and daughter, demons, would have to be taught a lesson. Joan was moved to the bedroom, where she was held down, while Leanne Reichenbike was ordered to sit on her stomach and bounce up and down so that the devils might be persuaded to make a move. At some point, it was established the spirits had shuffled on up towards Joan's chest, which came in for special attention. Leanne and Matthew took turn pulverizing her breasts, while the other beat the woman about the head and neck. Matthew pumped on Joan's throat with all of his weight, extracting the demons like, like paste from a tube. Each time Joan closed her eyes in pain, Matthew poked them open with his thumbs so that the spirits may see the heroic champions of God against which they would fight in vain. Ralph and David stood by, hollering verses from the Bible, raising their voices to extinguish the cries from a woman beset by the agonies of the damned. After two hours, Princess Joan and her demon child were identified as hanging on tight to Joan's tongue. So while the others held Joan down, Matthew Nusky opened Joan's mouth so wide that he almost dislocated her jaw, giving the spirits ample opportunity to escape. He held Joan Volmer like this for close to an hour, her tears and gurgling sounds proof that the demons were on their way out. Suddenly, the thrashing, tears and choking stopped. There was a loud, supernatural hissing and groaning that rose from the depth of Joan Volmer's body until at last she was still. Nusky proclaimed to the relieved and exhausted brethren that the spirits had been defeated and had fled. At this moment, several members of, of the people gathered, Ralph Volmer in particular, noticed that Joan had actually stopped breathing, it appeared to have no obvious heartbeat. Leanne gave Mrs. Volmer mouth to mouth and he gave her cardiac compression but there was absolutely no glimmer of life. He said later that none of them rang an ambulance or a doctor because the Lord kept promising them that he would return her. Nusky declared the situation quite normal, assuring the others that Joan would eventually be arisen if everyone kept praying. Nusky then left the farm, as he had other things to do and others to save. Or maybe he just had to go and mow a fucking golf green. The group waited and prayed over Joan's dead body for two days. Two days. And then Leah Clugston arrived at the farmhouse. The 78-year-old had given early phone advice to the group on how best to proceed, and then she herself received word from the Lord that she should place her hands on the bloated, quickly decaying body and order Joan to rise and walk. When this failed to rouse her, Clugston called a local Baptist minister for guidance. Roger Atsy came straight over, Whereupon he found Ralph, Leanne Reichenbach, and David Klingner in the kitchen eating lunch, while the body of Joan Volmer lay decomposing in the bedroom, her fluids leaking from her body into the bedclothes and all over the floor. It was 40 fucking degrees! He looked at the three eating lunch, looked at Joan, and then back to the three eating. Yeah, no to the food, thanks. He politely declined their lunch invitation and rang a doctor, who arrived and immediately called the police. When the police arrived, they found the trio praying in the kitchen while Joan's body continued to rot in the 40 degree heat. Her corpse was swelling and bulging, flies everywhere. The astonished officers were then told by Ralph that they were so lucky, like they were about to witness one of the greatest miracles 
they had ever seen in their lives. Joan was going to be resurrected and would shortly come strolling out of the bedroom, a picture of health. People have been raised up before, this, this wouldn't be the first time. So of course that didn't happen. When she didn't emerge, Ralph became convinced that God had postponed Joan's resurrection for three days, which was also the day of her funeral. In the meantime, faced with a situation they were later to describe as quite bizarre, the police took statements at the farmhouse and recorded interviews later that evening. Invited to witness this fantastic event, more than 50 media representatives attended Joan's funeral and possible resurrection at Horsham Cemetery. Ralph brought clothes for Joan to wear when she rose, as she was likely to have a new body. Media photographed him as Joan's coffin was lowered into the grave. It was not until the dirt was being tossed onto the coffin that Ralph finally broke down and cried. He said that she had obviously loved heaven so much, she didn't want to leave. Police carried out further recorded interviews in April after receiving the autopsy report. They then charged Ralph Vollmer, Matthew Nusky, Leanne Reichenbach and David Klingner with manslaughter. The autopsy found pressure on Joan's neck helped cause a heart attack as her thyroid cartilage had been fractured. Not that anybody in the room at the time thought Joan Vollmer had died. Leanne Reichenbach and David Klingner later wrote to Minister Roger Atze seeking absolution for their role in the exorcism. They said, in relation to our involvement in recent events, we would like to express our sorrow and seek your forgiveness where we have acted in the flesh outside the will of God. We recognize that we can and do make mistakes and we need God's grace and forgiveness. He didn't give them absolution. After a four-day committal hearing in September 1993, the charges against the four involved at the exorcism were thrown out by a Horsham magistrate, Tim MacDonald. The magistrate found that there was insufficient evidence to proceed to trial, but acting as coroner on the same day, he confirmed the four had in fact contributed to her death. Insufficient fucking evidence, what the fuck. At the close of the committal, Ralph Vollmer remained confident that Joan had been possessed and that it was God's will to take her home. The alternative, which he clearly saw as far worse, was to lock her up in a psychiatric institution, possibly for the rest of her life. Many people in the local community were angry at the result. One Horsham resident described the case as religion gone mad. Another worried that the local charismatic Christians would now start booking people in for deliverance ministries. And a Horsham greengrocer said justice had not been done, as no one had been punished for Joan's suffering and death. However, Director of Public Prosecutions, Bernard Bongiorno, uh, overturned the magistrate's decision in February 1994 and ordered all four to stand trial. During a sensational seven-week county court trial in Horsham, the defendants challenged the Christian court to renounce their belief that the devil exists. They called upon men of the cloth to declare it true. They quoted from the Testaments, old and new, citing exorcisms for, performed by Jesus Christ and Jews. They recalled the exorcisms of Luden in 1634, during which nuns were seen to convulse so violently they needed to be slapped and abused and restrained. Leah Clugston, shivered and shook in the stand, panting like a dog as she testified to being overwhelmed by the voice of God. They dared the judge, the jury, to deny their right to be good Christian souls who believe in the word of God as truth. I am not here in any way to criticise religion. You can put that to one side because they went way past that, Prosecutor Peter Jones told the jury. They had no consideration for Christianity. They went right past that. They were on a frolic of their own. An unlawful frolic. Mr. Jones was critical of Ralph Vollmer for not realising that his wife was sick and that no amount of exercising would cure her. He told the jury that common sense gave way to zealotry. Leanne Reichenbach and David Klingner were convicted of killing Joan Vollmer, with the prosecutor saying that she died as a result of an unlawful and dangerous act after excessive and unreasonable force was applied by them to Joan's neck. The judge found Leanne Reichenbach enthusiastically took a leading role in the exorcism and ordered her to serve four months in jail after suspending 20 months of her sentence. David Klingner was jailed for three months after having 15 months of his sentence suspended. Judge Graham Crossley directed the acquittal of Matthew Nusky on the manslaughter charge and the jury found Ralph Vollmer not guilty on his manslaughter charge as there was no evidence that either of them had touched Joan's neck. 
but Ralph was found guilty by the jury of recklessly causing his wife serious injury and falsely imprisoning her, and Matthew Nusky was convicted of false imprisonment. Ralph and Matthew both walked free after being given wholly suspended sentences of 16 months and 3 months respectively. Joan Volmer's sister Dorothy was angry that they served no time in jail. Ralph, Leanne Reichenbach and David Klingner appealed against their sentences, but those appeals were dismissed in 1995. Court of Criminal Appeal Justices Alex Southwell, William Ormiston and Alan MacDonald agreed with the sentencing judge, who said general deterrence was a very important aspect of sentencing in this case. The appeal judges said that people must be discouraged from believing that in the name of religion they can behave in this outrageous manner, and that in their opinion, the judge was entitled to impose custodial sentences for what was properly described as a very serious crime. Ralph Volmer left the Antwerp area, moving to Queensland with his third wife. In recent years, he's tried to shift the blame away from himself and onto the Ballarat Psychiatric Hospital, saying that he wouldn't have had to take matters into his own hands if the hospital he took her to for psychiatric help had done a better job. This fucking guy. And uh, I felt uh, the time had come for, for me to move on to, really, to, to get started again. Well, it's, a, it's not actually a fresh start, but it's the beginning of one. It's, uh, it's been two years now since uh, Joan is gone, so the time comes when we have to start again. I, I have no my, uh, doubt at all in my mind that uh, she was possessed and it wasn't, uh, wasn't an illness. She wasn't ill at all. People have been raised up before. This, this wouldn't be the first time. Uh, in my own mind, I have no doubt that she was. None at all. She was possessed? Yeah. The farmhouse side of the exorcism was resold several years ago, but remains empty. No one wants to live there. Today, it's a bit of a rite of passage for local teenagers to go in through a hole in the wall and perform a seance. As for Matthew Nusky, you know, the golf club assistant groundskeeper, the one who basically caused the exorcism to go bad, yeah, he's still a religious pastor. In fact, he's the lead pastor at the Dream Builders Church in Smithton, Tasmania. No good deed goes unpunished, I guess. Let's face it, exorcisms are psychological and physical torture. The people who perform them are ghouls and not representative of true Christianity. Good movies, though. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we troll through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick and go all stabby, stabby, stabby on that subscribe button. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. In all seriousness, it really does help us out. And remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you'd like to support the channel, please head to buymeacoffee.com j something and buy me a beer. I'm on Instagram at something about murder and I respond to every message I receive. So I hope to hear from you and I hope you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there.